Hello and welcome to DWeb Decoded, uh, the podcast videocast. Is that a thing? I don't know. Um, uh, about the decentralized web, uh, both the technology itself, its sort of implications for the rest of society, and also kind of some of the stumbling blocks and challenges it will face as it slowly takes over the world. Fingers crossed, because we. The backdrop here is we quite like the decentralized web here at the Falcoin and Falcoin Foundations uh, for the decentralized web. Um, someone else who really likes decentralization is Ross Shulman. Ross, uh, um, good to have you. Thanks for having me. Um, so you're now you 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 have decentralization in your title now. I do. Which I for think the, for the you first should time have in my had life. forever. Yes, well, yeah. thank you. Um, but yes, I, I am the senior fellow for decentralization at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, uh, an institution which, due disclosure, I used to work at, but is also been in the cutting edge of promoting and defending uh, decentralized tools of all kinds. For I hope your I hope your viewers are familiar with us. I hope so too. I mean, you never know, right? The world is divided. When I used to work there, which perhaps I go on about a little too much, but it's it's often a pretty similar influence on people's lives. The world is divided between people who go, you're doing great work. And people go, I'm sorry, I have no idea, not only what you're talking about, like what, who you work for, but what the heck this thing that you're trying to defend is, which is not great Just for my you. My friends, when I told them that I had this new job, sort of had like a blank, <laughs> blank stare, but that's okay. But, but that you have like that challenge because you're Washington based, and I think you've spent most of your life trying to explain these emergent technologies to to politicians and lawmakers. Not traditionally the most um, au fait. With it's been the better part of my my twenty plus year career at this point has been trying to trying to explain how all of this works uh, to people who uh, who want to get it but but don't yet. And how how did you end up in that very small intersection between people who play with technology before it's a thing and the the inner beltway or whatever it's it's called? Well, so I've always uh, I've always played with technology before it was a thing. Um, both both of my parents taught computer science before I was born uh, in 1980, uh, and so I, I came I came by it honestly. Um, and grew up with computers in the house, uh, you know, even in the sort of kind of late 80s, early 90s, uh, you know, internet access uh, before most people knew what that was and so forth. Um, and basically forever, uh, just expected that I was going to go and, uh, and be a software engineer uh, for, um, for a career. Uh, went to college, majored in computer science, didn't do much of anything else, uh, and, uh, and came to you know, my, my senior year of college, probably, uh, and, and realized that I, I was burned out on writing Oh, interesting. Um, right. Uh, you know, after doing it steadily for eight plus years at that point, uh, and, and, came, and more, more importantly, came, sort of came to the realization that if I actually went and tried to make money doing that, that it was going to kill my joy, the joy of it for me. Um, but of course, then well, that left me with almost nothing. <laughs> Nothing to do for <laughs> for a career, um, but you know, but I had been really interested uh, and 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 passionate about digital rights uh, going back, you know, to high school, right? And, and I, I still remember, you know, there was a a group of maybe five or six of us who were, you know, seventeen years old, but somehow had had the keys to our high school's uh, website, which you know, in nineteen ninety seven, to actually to even have a website. You right, know, right was was fairly advanced at the time but i remember turning the turning the website uh black uh for eff's uh protest against the C communications decency act back in 96 wow. i guess this would have been yeah. um and so so yeah so i've been passionate about that uh, ever since then going back a long way uh and so when when i came to graduate from college with kind of no no real direction in life i had a number of friends that moved to the beltway for guys that i had lived with throughout most of college. And I figured, you know what, hell, like, you know, worst case scenario, I'll kick around DC for a little bit and drink beers with my friends while I figure out what I want to do next. Um, but, uh, but so yeah, I moved to DC and started looking for work. And somehow 
not even knowing at the time how incredibly amazing this was, uh, you know, as you do or as you did then, I went around the halls of Congress handing resumes out to every, well, every Democratic office because that was my preferred party. Um, and uh, and got a call back from, of all people, Ron Wyden's office. Um, oh, wow. I know. And I had no idea at the time that that was going to, that he was going to, that he was the the guy to work for, the one, the one senator you might say that understood at a fundamental level how the tech really worked and why it was important. And still the case, right? Still the like case. 20, yeah, he's still 20 there. years on, like mm-hmm. there's not much more. I saw someone, because is he retiring? I hadn't seen that. Maybe he is. I mean, he's okay, been there for maybe, ages and ages. Maybe, maybe it was just someone being worried that mm-hmm. like we didn't have a, like a spare on Wyden. Um, yeah, no, it's, he's the kind of guy that you want more of if you can. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, so I ended up working for him. Uh, I, I interned for a month or so, and then they hired me on. Um, and uh, and that and that started kind of the the tech policy journey for me uh, in in two thousand and three. And it's an amazingly, I don't think people realize both like when people, I think a lot of people stumble into it, like 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 you say, but I don't think people realize quite what an influence you can have just being the person that understands these things. Well, uh, and particularly in, in 2003, context. there, you know, I think today we have a fair number of what we have come to start calling ourselves policy technologists, which is like people with a tech, a tech background, but who are in, intent on doing something about policy. And, and nowadays there's, there's a good number of us, but, right. uh, but in 2003, I think you could count on one hand, the number of people who we in DC were sort of, you know, could, could fill that niche. I should give a, Plug now to uh, so we we support EFF as hundreds of thousands of people do, um, but we also support a program called Tech Congress, which Love is Congress. actually puts these congressional fellows who understand about technology just into places, and really that's about just raising the level of people that that a staffer or a politician in 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 the U.S. Uh, federal system can like reach out and go, hey, you, you know something about this and have a good chance that they do. Because, I mean, I think the other the other avenue to understand these things in D.C. is always to go to the big companies, right? right. Um, and I think one of the challenges when you're trying to argue for uh, alternatives to a sort of corporate concentrated power onli- online like it's not like we pay a rep to to represent us. Like that's one no. of the problems of decentralization, right? Yeah, is the the uh, the 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 other model, uh, if you will, has by now very strong DC representation. Uh, not from- not always the case, though. Like I remember in 2003 so i guess that would have been before or around about the time google went public but a lot of these companies at that time of course they were smaller but they really didn't spend much money on lobbying at all not um, then no today yeah. today they do but no uh, yeah. uh you know back then i'm trying to remember exactly when it was but it was right around then that google opened the DC, their dc office for the first time Right, um, right. and, uh, and really started engaging, uh, and they, and they were one of the first kind of tech firms, uh, or, or new tech firms to do that. You know, I think the IBMs of the world had always sort of had, had, had their fingers in DC uh, to a certain extent, um, in, in not in, in no small part because a lot of them were defense contractors, but, uh, right. but you know, the, um, the, the new, the new tech, uh, companies were just starting at that point to understand, uh, that they needed to engage in DC. So just to sort of paint a picture for people, um, uh, I mean, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm just going to like paint my own picture and then you could go in and go, what? What are you doing? But like the way I imagine DC working, having spent a bit of time there and also Brussels, right? And these major sort of places of power is you have the politicians and their staffers who are the people who really kind of like, you know, write the, the proposals and guide policy. And then you have a kind of ring of these uh, companies with their pol- public policy representatives, and they have big events. And you go and like talk to them, and they're always really available. And then you have this like plucky gang <laughs> of um, 
of, like you say, like public interest technologists, nonprofits, occasionally sort of consumer groups or like user users, um, user groups, and they sort of occasionally get a, a word in edgeways in trying to explain these things. And I think one of the first times I met you in person was a kind of a demo day at the New America Foundation. Was that the... Yeah, um, uh, yeah. Well, they're, they are no longer the New America Foundation. They're just New America now. Uh, changed okay. the name because people kept coming them asking for money. Uh, and they were like, no, 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 we other way around. We we take money and do stuff. <laughs> um, but uh, but yes, exactly. Um, and, and, you know, that's... That's not a, it's not an incorrect kind of mental picture. Um, you know, I think what what civil society, which is sort of a, oftentimes a, a, a general kind of descriptor for the nonprofit plucky uh, folks that you were referring to, um, what civil society often has on its side um, are are kind of two things. First of all, um, the the the, the folks that sort of do the lobbying for higher stuff are valuable because they know people, right? They, they have the personal relationships that get you in the door, but they oftentimes don't have the depth of knowledge about a right. given topic that, um, that you might get from, from someone else. And so oftentimes civil society has that depth of knowledge. We have the, uh, the people who have thought really, really hard about these very particular issues for a really long time. Um, and then so oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes the other thing that we have is perhaps more credibility, uh, because there isn't a profit motive. Uh, there isn't, right, there right. isn't a dollar so you... behind the, uh, behind the ask, uh, like, like there may be coming from say a company, for example. And so mm -hmm. there's a, there's a bit more trust that comes with that. Now that trust obviously can be frittered away if you, uh, if you do if you do the, the wrong thing, but, but you at least have a little bit of that. Um, right. And so we are plucky, but we carry a big stick. <laughs> right. Right. And I think in the last few years, like a big, a big burden has sort of fallen on that, that, that particular contingent because increasingly, you know, there used to be a time when if somebody from Google say came along and said you know this would be good for the internet people would go oh yeah and the internet is good so we'll we'll, we'll do that right. and now i think you know for the last five ten years really um people have recognized that part of the problem is these these centralized um companies so now, like you have this bigger role where people turn to you and go, well, we don't trust those guys, but what have you got as, as an alternative? Um, yeah. And that's an opportunity. It's also, you know, it, it has its downsides as well. I mean, so for all, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll play the Google bashing game all day long, but, you know, and, and, and there are plenty of issues in DC with, where I would find myself on the opposite kind of side from Google, but there are also other issues where, where we worked, where I have worked with them quite, uh, quite happily over many years. And it was good to have them on, uh, on, on side. I mean, I think in particular of the fight to preserve strong encryption, uh, against, right. uh, against its, uh, uh, it being undermined and, and sort of becoming a tool mainly for, you know, governments to spy on their, uh, on their citizens. Uh, Google carried that torch, uh, for many, many years ineffectively as well. And so, um, and so the, the, the and I mean, the, you see it right now with, in the UK, right. Yeah. Where you suddenly realize, oh, it's the, it's not just the signals of the world, but like also the apples and even Facebook who are sort of holding the line against this idea that governments or anyone can, can, can peer into your, your private communications. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. But um, but yeah, but there are many other areas where um, where DC is coming to the realization that maybe you know maybe the, the words of Google ex cathedra are not like you know we shouldn't just follow that blindly right and there are there are issues of, of privacy and centralization and uh, and other uh, other kind of issues other kind of kind of concerns where where they might not have everyone's best interests in mind. But the knock-on effect I think there is that sometimes the response is just anti-tech. 
yeah. full stop, right? It's like, okay, well, Google and Facebook and Apple and whoever represent tech, therefore we need the opposite of tech <laughs> to yeah. like all tech bad. Exactly. Is that as yeah, a that technologist, is... is that painful for you? It is painful. Um, it can, it can, it can, it can kind of give rise to, um, I mean, it, it's sort of like a, a textbook throwing the baby out with the bathwater uh, kind of problem, right? Is that everyone is so fed up with these centralized services for a variety of reasons, some legitimate and some not, uh, some, you know, invented that, that the entire concept of, uh, you know, of internet freedom or of, of, you know, internet as like a source of, you know, good and joy and, uh, and, you know, prosperity uh, is being attacked um, in ways that, you know, are, is making the work that you and I are, you and I are trying to do that much harder. Right. I mean, I think, you know, we, we have this different vision for how the internet might work, but it's still painted with that brush. Right. And it's still right. viewed as, Oh, you're with the internet. I, you know, we don't want to hear it anymore. Uh, you know, you know, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to regulate you because you all have been running off the, uh, off the chain for, for two decades now and look where you've gotten us. Um, and it's very hard to go in there and say, no, 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 we're, 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 we're different. <laughs> we're, it's a different so internet. What, what is that vision of a different internet for you? Like what, what is, what are you, what picture are you trying to paint? Not only for lawmakers, but in your own kind of like head. So for me, it always comes back to, or, or I, 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 I answer that question by starting with, um, say, say, you know, kind of a question of my own, which is, I've got, I've got, a, I've got a son. He's lovely. Um, he's wonderful. He's eight years old now. And my mother would like it if photos of him could be fed intravenously into her brain <laughs> somehow. Right. Just like, you know, just constant stream. If I just had like a video feed of him at all times, she would, she would accept that. Um, and my mom is, you know, I mentioned at the kind of the top of the, of the, of the kind of recording, uh, not, She's not like your typical, oh, if, you know, if my mother can do this, my mom can do this. Like she writes technical right. documentation for a living or edits tech, technical documentation for a living. She understands the internet. She knows what it is. Um, but it still remains the, fe- the case, despite the fact that she and I both have supercomputers connected to the internet 24-7 in our pockets. Uh, and, some, and, and in some cases, more than one supercomputer, right? Um, I can't easily provide those photos to her without involving for some reason, some other company in the middle, whether that's Facebook, WhatsApp, Google photos, whatever it may be. Right. Um, There are ways to do it, but you need to be a super nerd, right? Like, okay, yeah, I could put, I could get Nextcloud installed on a VPS somewhere and I could give her a login. I could do the chef photo sharing. Bullshit. Like, excuse my French. I don't know if we do that on this podcast, but, but like the, can, the fact that, 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 that this isn't easy, that this isn't just natural, like the most obvious solution should be that like my computer takes the bytes that are this photo and gives them to her computer. We don't have to have anybody in the middle except for the internet backbone. Right? So that vision is, is what it, for me is fundamentally that is, that is the vision. Why why can I not exchange the data that I want to exchange with the people that I want to exchange it with all of whom have supercomputers attached 24 seven to the internet without involving someone somewhere in the middle. Now I recognize that that's not a global reality, right? Not everyone around the world yet has supercomputers connected to the internet 24 seven in their pockets. Um, But I think it's actually has better penetration than, than some might think. But fundamentally, that's the question for me. Like, how can I get the world to that place where I don't need somebody in the middle in order to just send an abstract bucket of bytes safely, privately, to whoever I want? And I think there are two sides to this. Like, one is, as a technologist who who sort of understands the nitty gritty of, of, of networking, that should be possible, right? Like right. it's 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 in some ways it's the simple the simple way of doing things, right? And simplicity gets you a lot of other other advantages. But the other thing is is that is sort of societally 
it feels less as you described like it's just weird right like i can explain the technology till the cows come home but once you convey to people look we're having a conversation i mean with you and i are having a conversation here and as though we were in the same room but there are all these other people and institutions in the room with us and that shouldn't be the case right that's like do you feel like politicians and lawmakers get that part of it that like why societally it's important to not have these these intermediaries i don't think so yet and i think that's partly because we have we've had this model of the internet for so long now that it just seems natural right it seems natural that uh for a social network to exist there has to be a company and servers in the middle it's we're not, we're not sort of conditioned to think of that as an intrusion. We're conditioned to think of it as necessary. Even when, mm-hmm. you know, as you and I might kind of get on this podcast and say, oh, it's not necessary. You know, most people, mo- most everywhere, you know, it, the, the question doesn't even occur, I don't think, um, right. as right. to why these, why these entities need to be in the middle, um, because they've just always been there. Uh, and, and it's just I- sort of been natural. I think beyond this, so, and we can talk a little bit about this sort of constant thing that we have chatted about before where politicians take aim at these big companies because they see the deleterious effects and then they just accidentally like take out like a huge bunch of emerging decentralized technologies. But I think there's this other thing that always worried me a little bit more was I thought it was very significant when... I guess it was like 2015, 2016 or something. Um, When Congress started pulling in people like Jack Dorsey and Mark Zuckerberg and, um, uh, you know, Sergey Brin or whoever from from Google and call them in to hold them to account. Right. And I think that's very satisfying for politicians, right? You can go, what are you doing? Right, right. But the very fact that you can do that just struck me as a huge red flag, right? There was a point where if Congress wanted to pull in the person who was in charge of the internet, I mean, who would they, who would they talk to? Um, You know, Tim Tim Berners-Lee, right, (laughs) right, right. (laughs) Just sit there going, I have nothing to do with me. Um, But I also think that politicians of all stripes, you know, want to make a deal, right? That's what politicians do. Mm -hmm. And so they want to have someone who they can make a deal with. And I've never worked out how you can, you can argue to someone who works in that sort of social environment that it's better to have no one. Right. Um, And no, it's true. There is, there is a certain amount of, um, I don't know if distrust is quite the right word, but it's in the right ballpark of, of this kind of concept of, of a completely leaderless decentralized system. I think it sounds to a lot of people like anarchy and how do you, you know, how do you make that work? You know, it's a very, um, I don't know, it's kind of almost like a Hobbesian kind of uh, fear of, uh, of ourselves almost that, that, that says that, you know, that's not, that's not feasible. You can't, you can't do that. Um, You know, it'll never work. Um, Despite the fact that there's plenty of human history that, shows that actually it works just fine. Um, And so, so yeah, so that I think there's, there's some aspect of not wanting to understand or, or, or not wanting to be, um, I don't know, not wanting to be impressed by it uh, because, because yeah, if, if, if it's leaderless, then how do I control it? Uh, You know, as as a a politician. Yeah, I guess more sympathetically, right? In many ways, politicians have to, his job is to solve the problems that completely um, flat systems like democracy kind of throw up. And, no, absolutely. Uh, and, and, and I think that there's, I think, to un, I think it's important for us to understand that motivation going forward if we're going to succeed. Uh, in in this sort of quest that you and I have taken on, um, because you know I, I think there's a, a some tendency amongst 
the kind of internet freedom community to to disregard some of the concerns that are coming up these days um, about about say you know to, to take take you know child child safety for example or um, or kind of harassment and and uh, and you know the deleterious effects of kind of the crazy freedom of speech that we have on the internet um, and and to sort of write those off as like not either not important or um, or or, you know, maybe not my problem because I'm an internet freedom advocate. But but the fact of the matter is that if we don't have answers for those, then then governments will do what we're seeing governments do, right? And, uh, and whether we like it or not, they very much view their job as protecting this, their citizens uh, and, and view the internet as something that is threatening their citizens right now. And so... Um, we can we can hate that, and I and I do. I don't like it, but 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 it is the reality that we're operating in. Um, and yeah. so, figuring out what we do about that and and how we respond to that is of the utmost importance because we can't just disregard it anymore. I do feel like we're almost in a second stage of this, which is that there was definitely a period where I think the hubris of internet advocates, like you know, like me, I'm not gonna hold you but um you know it's just this it will not only will this all be fine but like there's a sort of technological determinism to it that yeah. like free speech will just expand um and that will be a good thing right and then sort of the secondary effects begin to to, to kick in uh and then you begin to lose the rhetorical battle right because rather than people having to argue against you you sort of end up having to go, yeah, but actually like free speech does have all these like positive values, trust me, which is a, you know, a weak back foot to be on. Yeah. And we've been in that, that kind of state for, for a while now. Uh, I feel like now we're in this weird situation where like no one, like it's actually quite hard there are all these bad things happening now as a result of kind of restrictions or technological impositions to try and control these previous problems. And they're causing these second order effects, right? So you build censorship systems, you build surveillance systems to kind of combat this problem. And they're causing all of these things, which of course, you know, now we can be very smug and predicting, I knew that was going to happen, but, but no one knows, right? Because it's you 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 having to explain that that's the problems that people are facing now is is so difficult because you've sort of had to abandon explaining those principles in the first place I, that's a long-winded way of saying for instance that when people you know i've worked with a lot of people who are like we need to we need to restrict the distribution of information are now dealing with very serious sort of book banning programs or control of, of, of attempts to control how big tech um, moderates. Yeah. And it's hitting, it's hitting that it's hitting the very people that they were trying to protect. And I find it like it's, it, I'm not quite sure where to proceed now. Right. Because I, the only thing I know is to encourage and build the tools that will protect those people and allow them to speak. But I don't have the same kind of like gung ho ideological information must be free kind of banner to put that behind. It feels more like a grind. Um, I, uh, I am in, yes, absolutely. I think, uh, I have, uh, if anything, as I've gotten older and, and done this for, for a while now, you know, the nuance uh, just crash just, just comes crashing in on any topic that you want to talk about, uh, any topic you want to bring up. Um, and I think same thing, you know, when I was, when I was a kid, gung ho, you know, information wants to be free. Um, you know, uh, copyright is, is horrible and, uh, and, you know, uh, and so on and so forth. And, and I think looking at the world today, uh, and the internet today, it's super hard to come out and say any kind of pure statement about the internet and, and 
at least for myself, kind of feel that to be true, right? I mean, I think the only mm-hmm. thing I could think of, like I could probably think of is like encryption, right? Like that's, I'm, I'm still p- pretty pure on encryption. Like that's a, that is a technology right. that, that the average person should have access to. Um, but, you know, everything else is kind of, it's just been thrown into such chaos by the world over the last decade plus. Damn you, Will. I know, like, yeah, like all of this, right? Um, <laughs> that it feels really hard to say like, you know, um, to say kind of really, really, to ta- like total well, total statements. Let's, I mean, let's talk about encryption because I, I mean, I, I feel that same thing, which is interesting because, you know, for a long time, out of all the topics that you could imagine, new issues that came out of of discussing how to protect decentralized technologies, how to defend the internet, you know. They were all like weird, obscure things. They were like intellectual property law, public key encryption, net neutrality, you know, intermediary liability. liability, (laughs) Like you're all like, yeah, these are fascinating. And um, uh, but the one that like people still feel like this, this, this is a solid thing that we have to defend is encryption, and yet. Right now, what you're seeing is like there are like what are they called? Board uh, advertising boards, right? Accusing Apple of supporting child abuse. Yes, all over uh, San Francisco, I think. Yeah, right. And, and you're sort of going, okay. First of all, weird. Secondly, like who who is anti encryption to the extent that they will want to, because like, basically, I mean, for those of you who don't have all these advertising hoardings everywhere, basically what happened was is a year or so ago, Apple wanted to put scanning on, on your phone, right? It would scan for, um, abuse, abusive, known abusive imagery. Um, and folks like the EFF, I, I would say rightly, you know, ex- professional cryptographers push back extremely hard against this because it's basically losing control of like the the private data that you would have on your phone. It's like saying, sure, the cops can come in and sit in my my living room. Um, you know, we have we require warrants to come into a house. God, now I sound like one of those podcasts. But anyway, I should use the microphone a bit more. <laughs> but anyway, you you, you know, it, it, it's one of those like perimeter things. Mm-hmm. So Apple unusually kind of responded to that and said, "Okay, we're we're not going to do it. We un- we understand now. It's it, the the that people won't, aren't welcoming this." And now this campaign is basically saying Apple, um, I don't know, for purely evil reasons, right. <laughs> decided not to not to do this. Well, it's because they hate children. Like, I, that was in a press release. I'm pretty sure I saw that. <laughs> the, 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 right. <laughs> that <laughs> they Apple have them children. in the basement. So, yeah. the, um, so that that's a situation where you have this this strong line, right? Because encryption. Under like we cannot have decentralized technology without encryption because mm-hmm. otherwise everyone would be able to see everything that everybody else does. Mm-hmm. But now you're being thrown into this situation where it's good versus evil, and you're the evil ones, right? Like, yeah. How? Well, and the Apple thing is is fascinating for me, even kind of even deeper than just that, because to Apple's credit. And I, I was I was at the Open Technology Institute when Apple first kind of released this, and and just like EFF did, sort of did my own kind of analysis of what they proposed, um, and, and like like EFF found it to be not uh, not at the end of the day a workable solution. But if I'm being frank, and this is just my opinion, not not EFF's opinion, because um, I wasn't at EFF at the time. I think it was the most credible possible solution to this problem that I had yet seen. And I think right. to this it wasn't, day, to it this wasn't day, naive, right? It was not yeah. naive. It was, it was clear that they had a number of very smart cryptographers within Apple working on this. And the way that they went about doing it was very careful um, to try to reveal as little information as possible about the owner of the phone while still trying to find this kind of this sexual abuse, child sexual abuse imagery. Um, 
and and you know for their trouble they just got it from all sides right like mm. they 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 saw a societal problem uh tried to do their best to fix it uh or or offer a solution i guess not fix it but offer a solution and just like for their trouble just got slammed by everybody and their mother including now this, these ads that we're seeing uh, in San Francisco, where in, in the wake of all of us saying, no, like this isn't going to work. You can't do it. You can't do it. It's going to undermine encryption. So on and so on and so forth. Um, Apple stepping back and saying, okay, look, we met, you know, message received. Like, we'll go back to the drawing board. Uh, and even that step has, has landed them with these ridiculous, you know, ads accusing them of wanting to abuse children and knowing, you know, knowingly facilitating, uh, you know, the sexual abuse of minors, um, all of which is absolutely ridiculous and and over the top rhetoric but this is you know this is the the thanks you get for earnestly trying to solve a problem in today's society it's and i think that one of the other parts that the sort of lessons that i i i learn is you know there's a phrase that we use a little bit in in uh, 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 at the foundation and 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 just in building decentralized tools in general where you go, well, you can have a little bit of centralization as a treat, you know, like sometimes you just go, you know, the, the, we, we don't know how to do DNS. We don't, don't know how to do a name system right. with like out some kind of basic truth level. And so maybe if we had like, you know, 12 servers or whatever at the top, right. then, then everything else is decentralized. Did, well, did, did you watch the, um, the the DefCon uh, I don't know, reveal is the right word, but uh, of the Valid uh, framework. From, oh yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah. there was a, there was some point in there where uh, where <laughs> Dig Dog was like, um, you know, we, we use a little bit of DNS, but I promise it's not <laughs> it's it's not bad or something like that. And, it's not the bad kind, right? Right. Yeah. right. And, so and it, because it's yeah, it can come in handy sometimes. <laughs> yeah. So. And like one of the lessons is like you introduce a little bit of, look, I'll just be the person who's, you know, it, the arbiter of this, mm -hmm. right? Like it's just so much easier that way. Right. And then, um, and then the power just snowballs, right? Like the, the, you know, I think in the, we touch on it a lot in this program, but like the early years of Google, you know, they were really genuinely producing things that were, you know, uh, emails decentralized, but Gmail is a little bit centralized, but you know, it's so much nicer. Let's do it that way. And then you just watch this, this tiny concession kind of like grow and magnify. Mm -hmm. And I think some of the policy challenges, again, going back to, you know, politicians instinct, in instincts is they want to make a compromise. They want to do a deal. Right. right. And in a lot of these systems, I mean, you know, binary almost seems like a pun because like a lot of these technological decisions, you go, well, if you do it this way, Oracle ends up running everything. <laughs> and if you do it this way, well, no one's in charge, but like, that's what you're going to have to deal with. Right. So, and how... Like how do what are the comp what is the room for you as someone who is in these rooms talking to these people? How do you either present that in a way that doesn't have people running away screaming or just think you're lying? Um, and like what what room for compromise is there in this space? Like it's really difficult because you know I think part of the problem is that you know much of the rest of the world has looked at Silicon Valley and Silicon Valley has portrayed itself as these, as miracle workers for so long now as, you know, Oh, you know, you want, you know, an artificial intelligence that talks to you from your watch, you know, Oh, like you must be talking about Dick Tracy. No, no, no. Like we have it today. Like we can make that happen. No. Right. right. Um, and, and so, and so policymakers, not unreasonably, probably, you know, go, well, you, you put the AI in the watch thing. Why don't you just break encryption a little bit? Um, and it's really, it's very difficult to sort of, to, to go into that room and say, well, you don't quite understand how that works because, um, right. you know, it, it is, it is sort of like a, we'll, we'll, you know, we put, we put a man on the moon kind of, uh, kind of feeling to it. Um, and it's fundamentally hard to explain why we can put an AI on a watch, but we can't break encryption a little bit. Right. Um, right. You start, 
getting into like whether p equals np and, and like the you know hardness questions and you know godel's incompleteness theorem and you're like oh fuck i've lost them i like <laughs> it's, <laughs> right it's right like, it's it's not you know it's intuitive if you've done this your entire life but it isn't supremely non-obvious to anyone who hasn't why it should yeah. be that this particular problem is insolvable um and so or or requires so much sort of control and intervention mm -hmm. that you just lose your open society right, right? like well, that's yeah. the other part of it where... yeah the other part of it is absolutely that is that you know it's it's funny because like in a certain sense, it's a technologically insolvable problem, but in a, in another sense, it's not. It's a very easily solvable problem. Like we know how to do key escrow. Like that's easy. We just take a key and we give it to the government. Um, and uh, and you know the the policymakers that understand that much, you know, that then run into a second problem, right? So they they say, okay, well, I, I know what key escrow is because we we did this back in the eighties or whatever. Um, and so we're just gonna you know we're gonna do that again, except for this time the government we're gonna win. Um, give us the keys and, and I promise we'll keep them safe. Um, and, and then they really run into the second kind of problem, which is nobody wants to contend with the fact that the internet is a global network. Right. Nobody wants right. to deal with that fact. The li life is so much simpler when I don't have to think about China and Russia, right? As a policymaker, if I, if I can just say, well, I'm the U S and we're a democracy and we have rights and we have the bill of rights and, you know, courts and the rule of law and yada, yada, yada. Give us the keys. I don't care what you do about the rest of the world, but we have to worry about the rest of the world, right? They don't want to deal with that, but we have to deal with that, right? We have to go well, and also, tell China the rest, the, that right, yes, we the rest it. of the world doesn't has to worry about it too. They're right. going. You're going to give all the keys to right. Well, the there's US a reverse government. Problem. Absolutely, there's a reverse, <laughs> reverse problem, right? But uh, but yeah, but you know, somebody has to go to the Chinese government and say, yeah. We gave the keys to the U.S., but no, you can't have them. But I would really prefer if you didn't put me in jail right now. Um, and right. and that's just – it's not a great conversation to have. I, I feel like one of the – one of the sort of reverses of this, of like this, this is described in like internet policy circles as the tech harder kind of right. thing, where yeah, nerd, or nerd like harder, the yeah. <laughs> nerd harder, right? Whether they go, well, you, you, nerdsters should be able to just sort it out, right. but. The, the way of flipping it, I always think is like, yeah, this would all be sortable if we had a world government, right? A like right. trustworthy world government. Totally. You guys are politicians. You should know how to do that by Come now, on. right? Like, you know, you've got the United mm -hmm. Nations. Right, yeah. Like, go, go, go do it. And then come back <laughs> to us when you, uh, you have the solvable problem. Yeah. And I, as anyone who's ever been, so I've been to a couple of ITU meetings. The International Telecommunications Union, which is part of the, oh, part yeah, of the yeah, UN. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, Actually, I, I, no, older I than the yeah. UN. Well, yeah, no, older. You are you are correct. Older than the UN. Yes, it's now part of the UN, yeah. but it was not did not start that way. Right, but um, but no, I mean, it's it's uh, I I I fear like the idea of 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 a world government. Um, we've just got so many differences. I like the U S is barely holding it together. Like, um, you know, it's, it's just not, it's so, you know, which whose rights and which rights do we incorporate into a, a world government? That's just, it's so, so fascinating so, to watch but, the Russias and the Chinas and the, the, you know, the UAEs and the, and the, and the Saudi, Saudi Arabia's try to twist this idea of, sovereignty and uh you know and and uh you know internet uh you know the internet in our country should abide by our, our rules um that right. I, I don't i don't even know how you would attempt to kind of sort that out on a world government on a world level but i d i do remember when sort of this idea of internet sovereignty was this sort of idea that was put forward by i think it was russia and china and like it wasn't Kazakhstan, but like it was, mm -hmm. it was like you sat there going, okay, just the fact that it's coming from these countries probably means it's not going to get much further. But it totally did. Yeah. Like every country is now like, well, we do, we want some control and we understand that like, you know, we can only control things up to our geographical borders and therefore we're going to impose those geographical borders yeah. on the borderless internet. Yeah. And again, you've got this fork in the road of like either 
that's not going to happen because it's just not built that way. Or we can build it that way. Well, but you've I lost China, all the features. China has right. demonstrated right. that you absolutely can build it that way. Right. It, it is doable. Um, right. And uh, and yeah, I mean, I, you know, on my on my more pessimistic days, sometimes I feel like you know what we had we had a good twenty five ish years of of a global internet, uh, and it, but it was it was it was just it was too good to last, uh, and and that this splintering is functionally uh inevitable almost but uh, you know that's on my more pessimistic days but uh, see i'm 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 a ridiculous optimist about these things <laughs> that's why i, I love mean you, even Danny. even when i was at eff because like again we can reveal exclusively the <laughs> people at eff don't just you know send out press releases they sit and talk about this all the freaking oh, time interminably sometimes and <laughs> and you know i was mr no splinternet. Like, I think that there was a really strong argument that the internet is going to break up into these things. And how do we work as a, to build technology and to do all of these things. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, this is, I think one of the advantages of, uh, advantage consolations of working on decentralized technologies is that you sit there going, okay, how can we stop this pessimistic version from happening. Right. But I would say that even though I'm very confident that we can stick together that internet, these questions of governance and like, how do you code rights into these systems? Like people recognize, I think that there's a lot of challenges to running a, a, a decentralized system, right? Like, I mean, just governing it, right? Uh, I'm involved in Filecoin's governance. It's as hard as any other, it's as challenging as trying to find compromises in, in DC. Mm -hmm. But I, I find that op, a cause of optimism because everybody's working on the same problem, right? Everybody is like going, okay, how do we all work together when we have all of these differences of opinions? And yeah, like it's not as if that problem goes away. Um, if you if you stop thinking about it, <laughs> right? Just wish wish it wasn't um, here. We didn't have to deal with it. Yeah, right. Um, I just think it's funny that that um, uh, we have to do a lot of this stuff using the forms of of governance of of and of democracy that preceded them. Yeah. Um, well, and you know what? I think it's funny. Um, is the way in which uh, none of that was, or not none of it, but but it was not our problem in the centralized world, right? The right. the the entities right. that we were dealing with were fundamentally dictatorships, right? It was it was right. you know dear leader Mark Zuckerberg uh, on Facebook, and if you didn't like it, um, you know at least you had the opportunity to not be on Facebook, um, unlike I guess real world dictatorships where you I couldn't get out. Right. But but um, but, uh, but now that we're but that was like climbing over the right. the, the, the Berlin, Berlin Wall, Wall or something, yeah, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, but and and you know, so now, hey, like brand new world, we've got these decentralized tools and and techniques, and uh, and we're building these amazing societies, and then exactly what you're saying, suddenly realizing, oh shoot, wait a minute, like we have like we need some form of governance, like we, we can't just you can't be chaos, um, and uh, and finding out that that as hard as the tech is. Uh, the governance is harder, um, yeah. And uh, and not as not only is it harder, but but they didn't teach it. Like we didn't learn this in, in computer science class, right? Like nobody taught that. You need a whole other skill set that that most nerds like you and I never got taught or never came up with. Um, well, the thing I the thing I find most exciting about kind of um, you know, it's funny, we go through these these podcasts and then I never say crypto or web three once. And um and you know, we're sort of surrounded by it. And I know, you know, one of the reasons why is people don't like to talk about it anymore. But like one of the things that um I find really exciting about this space is that you do get people who have like experience in all of those areas and not just like the kind of accidental experts that that 
I hope it's no insult, but you, you and I are where we're like, well, I got a little right. bit of, you know, programming in basic and a little bit of, you know, model UN, right. I guess I can do this. I read an um, Eleanor Ostrom paper once. It's <laughs> I right. Got this. right. <laughs> um, it's people who are like going, yeah, I, these are the incentive systems that have led to this is like, you know, this voting and this quadratic voting. And then, but we tried those out amongst a hundred people and it didn't work out. So we're going to do this other thing. Yeah. And so I do feel that there is like the same level of innovation going on in like, how do we represent and, and find consensus as there was to building public key cryptography in the in the nineties or two thousands. Absolutely, so. and some of my favorite. So you and I both go to have been to the D Web camp for a number of years now, and and some of my favorite people to talk to there are always the the cooperatives uh, groups yeah. that come. They right. always have the most interesting uh, kind of uh, thoughts about uh, you know how the technology and the ethos and the the functional on the ground kind of uh, governance. Uh, kind of all meld together and they're just they're just fun people to listen to and, and learn from uh, it's absolutely true yeah, that yeah. that um that that bringing those people in to the movement has been great and, and fascinating uh and, yeah. and i think yeah. i think vital i think we're, we're going to find uh you know really really important down the road yeah and i mean i think we haven't really talked about like the the current kind of threats to all of this um, apart from the, the the encryption stuff, which is actually sort of worrying yeah. what's happening in the UK. Um, but in general, I feel like that is trying to work out ways of protecting or uh, representing in government in statute, like spaces for those experiments in governance hmm. and, and organization. Yeah. It's probably the best kind of positive, yeah. positive work we can do. I think the other really yeah. fascinating kind of an important work that's happening right now and it's 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 messy and almost bloody at times but but is the 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 work of discovering how we moderate the fediverse effectively um, right right uh, you know how how do we do community uh moderation how do we right how do we make that work in a in a decentralized way uh because we don't you mm -hmm. know we can't just yell at Facebook anymore, right? We have to, <laughs> it's like- yeah. Yell at each other. Right, yeah, uh, yeah. we have to yell at each other, right? Like the the, the greatest the greatest curse is to have succeeded. Uh, and now now we're the ones saddled with uh, with all of these problems um, as, a, yeah. as, a, as a sort of we as the, in the sort of grand sense of the whole community. And um, and like I said, you know, it's, it's, it's messy and it's bloody at times and it, it's, um, you know, there's name calling happening, but, uh, but the work is, is important. Um, and it's yeah. fascinating to watch. I, I don't, I don't run an instance. I mean, I, well, I do, but I'm the only user. Uh, I don't have a dog. I don't have a dog in the fight. <laughs> but, um, right. but, but, but other than to hope that we 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 can figure it out and and present. I don't know if it's. I don't know if there's going to be a solution, but you know, whatever whatever the sort of end result is, I hope it's positive. Um, and we so, can point to it. We could talk for hours, and we usually do. Sure. But but so um, but just to sort of like tie a bow on this, like one of the things that I always say about you is like I always find some like amazing new and exciting technology, and like I go into the community, and you're there already. <laughs> there are there have to be like, at least three oh. different IRC channels that. We have found each other. That we in. haven't yes. found yet. Yeah, right, right. Going, oh, Ross, yeah. great. You're, You're on this too. project too. Oh, yeah, right. well, it's really useful <laughs> to have you here, Ross. Um, but what, selfishly, what are you interested in looking at these days? So, in, yeah, in so I've been toying. Time? Yeah, I've, I've been toying uh, the last week or two with, with the Valid stuff. Um, they announced it at DEF CON and then I immediately went on two weeks of, of vacation. So I didn't get to play with it in late August when it was kind of brand yeah. new, but I've been, been playing with it you know, here in, in September, the last few weeks, uh, and just seeing what it's capable of. It's really, it's like, it's an interesting kind of, uh, melding of Tor and IPFS and, uh, and stuff. And I, I, I don't think I've kind of plumbed the depths of it yet, but, um, but it's been fun to toy with. So, uh, I've been, yeah. I've been following that. Um, I've been, I've been having a good time watching, uh, the Sprightly project, uh, build a, uh, a scheme to wasm uh, uh, compiler that's been interesting, uh, and and you know I had a chat with them. My favorite, yeah, right. Uh, I had a chat with them um, 
I guess it was, yeah, just before I went on vacation, so early August as well. Um, and uh, and learned all about the, kind of the work they're doing with the, the OCAPN uh, protocol specification of, you know, uh, KIP, you know, uh, a, a common protocol for capability network networked capabilities, uh, which is just kind of incredibly fun nerd uh, nerd sniping for me. And I just like uh, I go down that rabbit hole and uh, and and have a have a great time kind of following what they're up to. Um, so yeah, there's there's all that, and then you know uh, I think Blue Sky is kind of the other interesting thing. They're yeah. they're iterating uh, kind of really rapidly on. Uh, on kind of the third party stuff. So it's not just like the one app on uh, on Android or, or iOS anymore. There's now there's other there's other um, uh, there's other apps to ingest it from. There's also now you can basically subscribe, I think our like an RSS feed of literally every post on the blue like the fire hose of blue sky basically is out there now and you can you can sort of follow that as well. And and so it's uh it's uh it's kind of interesting to watch that and then compare that with the Fediverse model and the, uh, of of kind of like more server to server uh, kind of communication and 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 try to you know see what what's going to win or or more likely what like what what can we pick from all of these different experiments to to sort of put together the 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 best kind of solution out there. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I don't know. That's, uh, there's 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 so much going on. I, yeah, like you said, I think we could talk. Uh, we could talk all day uh, about kind of the the interesting and fun tech that uh, that is out there. So um, uh, I feel like I should I should give you some to to look at as in Please. a sort of mutual exchange. So um, Eero I R O H is a reimplementation of IPFS that is super interesting okay. and um, is in Rust. So you know, must be the hot new, new, the hot new thing. and exciting. Yeah, um, I'm really so we had on as a guest um, uh, Brooklyn Zelenka, um, who works at a thing called Fission, mm-hmm. and she's been working with the Sprightly people, but they are working on a thing called IPVM, which is a virtual machine for executing code in the IPFS ecosystem. Okay. Um, and the reason I say that this is interesting is because. I had a problem the other day and went, oh, wait, IPVM could actually solve this. That's always fun. Which is not usually (laughs) the way I think about this. But just to leave you with it, like the idea is is that if you have like a hash or a CID of a function, that means you know when you call that function that it's the thing that you originally wanted it to be. So it solves a lot of versioning and and, uh, reproducibility issues and stuff like that too. And have you seen Wiki Function? Yeah, I, you know, I have seen reference to it. It's, but I don't, I didn't quite understand what it was trying to do. But Me it, neither. But it was like it was trying to compute over Wikidata. data, and I like Wiki data is one of my favorite. Like OpenStreetMap and Wikidata are like two of my favorite yeah. uh, kind of internet things that exist. So I was I was very yeah. intrigued by by the Wiki Function thing. I, I think I only saw it in like it's early like literally like the day it launched and so there was no right, nothing right, right. there but i but i want to know more about it yeah yeah me too me too i have no like it's just one of those things that sparks my, like you say nerd snipes right. me so those are my those are my tips nice i'm gonna go um, to google i'll see you on the irc <laughs> channels sure. of all of <laughs> it's all it's all discord <laughs> nowadays you know it's, i'll see you yeah it's true no, it's nobody true. irc why anymore. not decentralized it? anyway i've already said that yeah. in a previous <laughs> Clip this was a pleasure from, from the podcast. So, always you. a pleasure, and um, uh, like I say, see you on the chat channels, yes. and see you in a glorious decentralized future that we're gonna, we're gonna as soon as we build and it. enable. <laughs> yes, as soon as that we get, we'll get right on this. Yes, okay, thanks a lot. Ross. Have a good one. See you. Next. Bye.